Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Put a Fork in It podcast, the podcast delivering fresh perspectives at the intersection of food, health, business, and creativity. I'm your host, Kalina Cahill, founder and creative director of CC Photo and Media, a Hudson Valley, New York-based photo-centric marketing company. Today's guest is Marika Blasfeld. I first met Marika at a group called Hudson Valley Women in Business and knew she would be perfect for the show. Marika is a certified holistic health coach, yoga teacher, international retreat host, dancer, author, and speaker. Marika was born in Estonia and moved with her parents to Germany shortly after being born. During our interview, she shares her story of international living during a time when travel into and out of her native country was very challenging. Marika earned an MFA in Berlin and was a featured soloist in the New York dance scene during the 80s and 90s. In 1995, she purchased a farm in her native Estonia, which was a childhood dream come true, and then transformed it into an arts and wellness center. Now she spends summers there facilitating yoga and cooking and wellness retreats. Marika has appeared on several Estonian TV cooking shows and was invited to do a cooking demo as a VIP chef at the Paris Cookbook Fair in 2012. Reviews of her artistic and culinary skills have appeared in the New York Times, Martha Stewart Living, The Village Voice, as well as European editions of Health, Lifestyle, and Cooking magazines. She regularly writes articles for Estonian publications and speaks on healthy eating and living both in Europe and in the United States. She has also published two cookbooks, one of which is in both Estonian and English, called Essential Nourishment, Recipes from My Estonian Farm, a fundamental education in self-care, which is doing extremely well in both versions. Reader feedback has consistently been enthusiastic, and in 2012, it even won a Gourmand World Cookbook Award in Paris and the Living Now Book Award Gold Medal in the United States. It was also a finalist for Forward Reviews Book of the Year Award. In 2014, Marika published her second cookbook in Estonia and is now seeking an agent and publisher to publish the second book in the United States. During our interview, Marika and I discuss a lot of great topics, including publishing, health coaching, being a dancer in the 1980s, and so much more. I'm really excited to share this interview with you, and I hope you're as inspired and fascinated by Marika's life story as I am. So thanks, Marika, for joining me on the podcast today. I'm really excited to dig in and discuss your background and your business. Okay, thank you for having me. So um, by now, the listeners have heard a little bit about um, what you're doing these days and your business, uh, but can you tell me just briefly how you got to where you are right now well um how far back do you, <laughs> you want to start ah uh, you know just pick pick the points uh that you know turning points okay well i guess the first turning point was that um after being born in estonia um i was just a year and a half old when my parents immigrated to west germany so uh, i don't remember that uh, but uh, I do remember that I grew up, <laughs> grew up in Germany. What part of Germany? Uh, I lived near Dusseldorf which is people might know Cologne you know a more famous city so uh, along the river Rhine on sort of the northwestern part of, of Estonia. Oh sorry Germany, uh, Germany, <laughs> Germany yeah. yes. So I went to school there, and um, then after I finished high school, I decided I wanted to take a year off. I wanted to explore life as opposed to going to the next school. And I have relatives in Sweden, and one of them is a textile designer. And I was interested in arts or design, so uh, she offered me that I could stay with her for a whole year. And she would find me a job in the textile industry, and so I could learn about it and see if that's something I want to pursue in the future. So I did that, and um, it turned out I was only allowed to work for three months because it was sort of like a student exchange type of visa that I got. And uh, But I wanted to stay the whole year in Sweden, so then we decided that I should go to school there. And she happened to live in the city where there is the 
Swedish Textile Institute. So I did a year of schooling there, which was really great. But then I decided, no, I don't want to go into design. I don't want to go into textile. I want to study real art. And that brought me to Berlin. So I went to art school in Berlin and I studied painting. And uh, so that was in like 77 or 8 I started in Berlin. And uh, a couple years later, can't be that many years, maybe just two, <laughs> um, I discovered dance uh, kind of at a late age uh, because I was already 20 years old or mm -hmm. 21. Yeah, that uh, is but a in the bit late for yeah, dance. exactly, and I had always had this interest for dance. But I thought, you know, if you don't start with four or five years old, you know, in a ballet school, then you know you cannot become a professional dancer anyway. But um, in the same school where you know you could study art, we also had a department uh, for actors and musicians, and for the actors, they had dance classes. So I just kind of stumbled upon them and I started taking them and it was, first it was jazz dance, uh, and it became really interested to me, interesting to me and I wanted to pursue it some more. And then, uh, somebody who had also studied at the school and had spent some time in New York and Philadelphia and studied contemporary dance came back to Berlin to put together a big project with the students. Uh, so it was kind of a, an experimental dance theater project where the students then did both the movement and also designed the costumes and the set. So somehow I got involved and uh, that really opened my eyes to dance and that there are other ways of approaching dance than, you know, doing classical ballet. And it was really, really exciting. And uh, so more and more, I realized that this is really what I want to do. So I worked with this person for maybe a year. We did two performances in that time. And then I thought, no, now I have to go to New York. And I was lucky that my professor at art school uh, let me go. But officially, I was still studying in Berlin. So I didn't lose any time in my art studies. You know, it was like I was in two places at the same time. And then, first I just wanted to go for a semester to New York. And then, of course, I liked it so much I wanted to stay longer. I stayed a whole year. I mean, that her, for her, uh, for that whole first year was uh, so amazing. And in the 80s, New York, I mean, was just the mecca of dance. It's really not like that anymore. It is a very different feeling in terms of the dance world now in New York. But then there were all these interesting people doing their own thing, which was very different from any, you know, classical ballet or even modern dance. And people were exploring different ways of movement and performances would take place in, you know, off, off Broadway in some church or in some basement or, you know, some old factory. Um, and, um, I probably went to see performances every night and they cost like $2 or $3, you know, <laughs> so, you know, you could afford it. And then I just went to all kinds of different studios to take dance classes to, uh, you know, uh, practice different styles. I did take all the, let's say, the classical modern dance techniques like Graham and Limon and then um, Graham and also then later Cunningham. Uh, and then I... Uh, I was really lucky because um, I had met somebody in Berlin before I came to New York who was originally from New York, and he was a theater person, and he said, well, as long as I'm in Berlin, you can stay in my apartment, which he shared with another person. So that was great. So I had a place to stay. And then he also had written his friend, uh, her name is Bonnie Stein, that, uh, you know, I would be coming and she should take good care of me. <laughs> so Bonnie is, uh, is my oldest friend in New York. And uh, when I arrived, I called her up and I said, yes, uh, let's meet. And we said, let's meet on Bowery and Third Street. <laughs> and I will be wearing blue. <laughs> It must have been a very impactful day if you remember Bowery and Third Street, and I will be wearing blue. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so th this this was a time where I was wearing only blue clothes. Anyway, so <laughs> so we met, That's and it was maybe the middle of the week, and then on Saturday already she took me to a rehearsal of another dance theater project by Anne Wilson that she was involved in. 
And so, you know, there I was, and, you know, already rehearsing in New York and just being here like three or four days. So that was pretty cool. So that whole first year kind of was like this, you know, just this amazing, I mean, the whole city is so amazing. You can feel the energy on the streets, you know, all this creative energy and everybody's doing something creative and it was really, really, really great. So then the a year passed by and I thought, okay, I guess I have to go back to Berlin now and continue painting. And <laughs> so, gee, how terrible. Yeah, really. <laughs> Let me go back to Berlin so, and paint. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back and um, I remember maybe a week or two in that I was in the supermarket buying some food and I just had a nervous breakdown. I just... <laughs> started crying and I just did not want to be there anymore you know I just really wanted to be back in New York right away so actually then was the time when I talked to my professor uh, that I want to go back and he said okay you know you can just do it and once in a while you know come back once a year kind of thing and show me some uh, visual art as well and then that's how we we worked it hmm. Yeah, so then I pretty much got stuck in New York and uh, lived there until 2006. So that would be from like the early or mid-70s? No, mid-80, exactly. 80, 1980, 80, right, I right. came to New York. And then only uh, in between like 83, 84, I went back for a whole year to Berlin to really finish school. So I did my thesis work and did my final exhibition. And so I did finish school, you know, officially and <laughs> have my paper somewhere. I've never really used it uh, for anything. Um yeah, and um, and then, uh, I mean, I've always had contact also to my birth country, Estonia, and growing up in Germany at home, we, we spoke Estonian, so, so I didn't uh, lose the language. And um, every couple of years, we would go visit my relatives, uh, which, you know, then was Soviet Union time, and you needed a visa. Uh, you couldn't just pick up and say, okay, I'm going to Estonia, but it had to be planned several months ahead. And, and some years we didn't get the visa, so we couldn't even go. And then so, there were all kinds of rules attached to that. We were not allowed, some years we were not allowed to stay with our relatives. We had to stay in a hotel. Uh, we also were not allowed to leave Tallinn, which is the capital of Estonia, to visit the countryside. We have to, had to stay within city limits and you know that sounds really like complicated that. yeah so it was uh it was a very very different time so so then if you left when you were one one and a half yeah then you would still have been an estonian citizen or yeah i was and uh, you had to get originally. a visa still or oh or no, did you then, become uh, no well we we immigrated to germany so all the paperwork was done before and we kind of had uh permission to leave mm -hmm. yes and the reason was uh, uh the reason for that was that my father's my family on my father's side the ancestors were german so many generations ago, they left Germany and actually settled somewhere in Russia and then from Russia moved to Estonia. So my father was born in Estonia and he considered him, himself Estonian. But his parents both spoke German and he also learned German at home hmm. while growing up in, in Estonia. So then, uh, and then in the period between the two world wars, um, Hitler called all the Germans back to Germany and my father's family actually did go back to Germany. But then my father decided to go back to Estonia. <laughs> but so then after the war, and this is, this is now like 59, his mother was still alive and also his brother, both of them were living in Germany. And that was the reason why we were allowed to immigrate. Mm -hmm. at all you know it's very unusual that at that time anybody could leave Estonia but there were a few exceptions so so we were allowed to immigrate and that's how we ended up in Germany and uh, the first time I went back to visit Estonia I was uh, eight years old and your your mother she was she Estonian? She was Estonian, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But she had also learned German in school, so, um, you know, she integrated 
So where exactly is Estonia? <laughs> I haven't looked at a map recently. <laughs> yeah, so it's um, it's considered a Nordic country, and it is um, by the Baltic Sea, which is between you know Finland and Estonia, and then Sweden. Okay. It's 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 a big in okay. in inlet kind of uh, uh, sea. So, it's not an ocean, and. Um, so to the east of Estonia is Russia, to the south of Estonia is Latvia. Okay. And then to the north across the Baltic Sea is Finland, and to the west across the Baltic Sea is Sweden. Okay. Yeah. How many countries are between Estonia and Germany? Uh, well, there is Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and then comes Germany. Okay, so it's, it's the one that borders Russia. Though you said, yeah, it does. Okay. On, on oh, so the, it borders Russia. Yeah. Okay. All right. And it's a tiny country. I mean, we only have one point two million uh, people living in Estonia. Okay. Huh. Mm-hmm. All right. Interesting. And then when um, you know when things started to open up in Estonia, uh, like nineteen eighty eight was an important year where. Uh, Estonia has this tradition of um, having these big gatherings where where the people, you know, all the choirs of the country come together and sing together. They even built a special band shell for it that can house 50,000 people. Wow. <laughs> and it's located, it's kind of in the perfect spot where behind the band shell, a little, you know, across the street, you have the Baltic Sea. And then in the on the other side of the band shell is a is a little hill. So then the audience, you know, sits on the hill. There are some seats on benches, but then the the big ball just sits on the grass when that happens. And then all these choirs, uh, you know, they practice a certain uh, repertoire, and then they can all perform together. Wow! And they do this every five years. Um, but then spontaneously in 1988. The Estonian people just met on the grounds of this song festival and started singing together. And that's where also the expression uh, singing revolution comes from, that Estonia practically sang its way to freedom. Hmm. And uh, so luckily the transition there went without any major, you know, physical violence. Uh, Like in Latvia and Lithuania, there was quite some, you know, violence. And um, and then ninety one was the was the year that Estonia actually did gain independence again. Mm. Yeah, and and I happened to be in Estonia at that time, or I happened to be in the Baltics anyway. I was actually in Lithuania um, uh, assisting an American choreography uh, choreographer uh, to set a piece on a Lithuanian dance company. And I remember that day we were upstairs in some building in a dance studio rehearsing and downstairs there was always this table and an older lady sitting there kind of keeping track on, you know, what goes on in the building. So as we were coming down, she was saying, Estonia is free, Estonia is free. And we were like, what? (laughs) So that was really, really amazing. Yeah. And um, ever since, you know, Estonia becoming free, obviously it was easier to travel there. And um, and then uh, just four years later, yeah, I bought my farm. And, uh, and that's been something that I've always dreamt about uh, ever since I was a small girl, that I was, I was going to live in the countryside one day. Hmm. And I've always enjoyed going to open air museums where you can see like old farmhouses and you can go inside and you can kind of imagine how people lived. And I just love that type of architecture. I also love that connection, you know, to nature, to the elements, um, fire, you know, water, um, growing your own stuff. And, um, so, a lot of uh, farmhouses had been abandoned or people were, you know, just considering that they have to leave because they didn't have the money to restore it. You know, it was old buildings that started to fall apart. 
And so the same in my uh, case, um, where the family, you know, all the roofs are leaking and they said, well, we don't have neither the money nor the energy to restore this farm. And it's not just one building. There were like four buildings. And uh, so they, yeah, decided to sell it. And I happened to be the first person to see that particular one. And, um, I mean, when I, when I had decided, okay, this is what I want to do. And I went to Estonia and I actually put an ad into the paper that I'm looking to buy a farm. Um, then, uh, I got a bunch of phone calls and I went to maybe see, you know, six or seven places. But when I came there, it was so clear that this is the right place. It was uh, a very, um, emotional kind of, uh, powerful, um, thing that happened to me <laughs> where I, I stepped into the main building and into the kitchen, which also, uh, was used in the old uh, days, uh, to dry the grain. So typically these kitchens have a, a taller ceiling and, um, then there's a big oven, uh, that you fire with, with wood, uh, that has a, a, a door that you can open. So, so all the soot and all the smoke also comes into the space. And that's what they used to dry the grain with. But then all the soot and the smoke goes up and that's why the ceiling is totally black. And uh, it's very cool. That can't be healthy, though. <laughs> no, I mean, it's not coming down or anything. Yeah. Uh, and I had never seen that in my life mm. before, so that was, like, very mystical almost. Mm. And then the, uh, the the owner, the woman, she was in her late 60s. She was stood there with a white apron on, and uh, there were some... Um, some... Um, blanking out... Not spices, but what are the other things? Herbs. The herbs, yes. <laughs> Some herbs hanging, drying. And um, and then so, something just kind of came over me and I just started crying. I had goosebumps all over my body and I was just in the this, in this state for about five minutes, I would say. And uh, so other people have told me later that was... Uh, sort of meeting with the spirit of the place and being accepted by the spirit so anyway i uh, i've never you know regretted that decision to buy that farm and i love that place and it's really <laughs> really very special yeah. that's great um so i think you left off in your story and around like um <laughs> you were in new york dancing from 1980 until about 2006. Yes. And you bought the farm in Estonia in about 95. 95, yeah. Okay. So, so you were I dancing would, that whole time. I was still dancing, yeah. And I would go back and forth as I do now, too. You know, I would spend like five months or five and a half months in the summer in Estonia. And then the winter, I would be in New York and continue dancing and performing. And then at some point, uh, we were renting just a tiny uh, apartment in the East Village, my husband and I. Um, we decided that, you know, maybe it's time to leave the city and maybe we should own something as opposed to paying rent. And um, and then Beacon was kind of a buzzword. Uh, word. Uh, I, we had heard about it. And um, then my friend Susan Osberg, who is the choreographer, who uh, I had worked with earlier, uh, she and her husband moved to Beacon, and then we came up here to visit them. And we went to Dia, and we thought, well, this is not such a bad place. <laughs> <laughs> At least I knew there were some cultural things happening in Beacon. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, and pretty much, you know, a year later, we moved here too. Huh. So that was probably like 2007-ish? No, actually it was two th we bought the house in 2005 in December and then uh, 2006 we moved here in March or so. Yeah. And so how did you get involved in your health business? Well, that already started in New York and that really started um, when, you know, I had started with my farm. First it took me a couple of years to just kind of restore all the buildings and what I did I turned it into an art and wellness center. So we have a dance studio, we have an art studio, and later we built one more smaller building uh, to house the sauna, 
as well as a small writer studio. Um, and so the idea was to offer the studios for artists, artists to be there in residence, but also to do workshops, retreats, and that, those kinds of things. Um, now I wanted to say something else. I was still dancing, we were saying. <laughs> <laughs> You were still dancing from... Oh, why I started the health, oh, health yes. coaching thing, right. So once I started to have guests at the farm, I realized that, you know, I have to feed them because there are no restaurants nearby and, you know, you're in the middle of the countryside, so you have to provide. And um, and in the first couple of years, I just kind of did it by... I just, you know, winged it. <laughs> <laughs> And then I thought, well, maybe it would be a good idea to get some education in nutrition. And, you know, I wanted to make sure that I can really offer my, my, my guests, you know, uh, healthy, nutritious, balanced food. So then one day while I was in New York in the winter, uh, the, um, the catalog for the Institute for Integrative Nutrition ended up in my mailbox. And I looked at it and I thought, wow, you know, this is the perfect school for me. <laughs> like I was like totally amazed that something like this even exists. Mm -hmm. So then I, yeah, signed up <laughs> <laughs> and did like a one year program uh, to become a health coach. And then later I did another year immersion program where, uh, I mean, we had a lot of business training in the first year as well, but the second year was more focused on, on getting your business going. And that was actually a great uh, program. I think it's different now. But back then, uh, when I was a student, uh, I had a mentor uh, who was, you know, like an alumni of, of uh, IIN. So when I did that extra year, I became a mentor to the new students. And that was a good experience because I had them, you know, I had 14 students that I had to take care of and uh, I had like uh, 50 minute sessions with them every other week or such, but they were all ganged up in one day, like in like seven one day and seven the other day. So you really got that experience where you have to, you know, work with one person, you have a 10 minute break and then you have your next client, mm. so to say. So that was really great training. And uh, yeah. So I started my business already in New York City, but then when we moved, moved up in Deacon, I just continued. And, um, but however, you know, because I'm going back and forth between Estonia and Beacon now, it's really hard to keep something going because I'm away for half a year. People forget about me. I come back in the fall. Nobody knows who I am. <laughs> you know, I have to kind of <laughs> crank the whole machine again from zero. And so that's why I have now... Uh, decided that I want to rather um, do more programs online because my mailing list too, I have a lot of people in Estonia who are on my mailing list and a lot of people here in the States and some in Canada, some in other countries in Europe. And so it makes sense that I, I would offer things that people can do wherever they are and can, can do it at home and online. And so I have started already a couple of years now with a spring cleanse and also an autumn detox. And this year I want to develop uh, a 15 day clean summer eating uh, challenge. So that will be sometime in July. Mm -hmm. So I think um, a lot of people have probably heard about health coaching. They maybe have even heard of the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. Because mm -hmm. I, I mean, I know that when I'm not working out in the world, I meet a lot of people that are like either a health coach or they bring up that they went through that program. Yeah. Um, so can you kind of unpack the concept of health coaching, uh, for people that are maybe like, it's a buzzword. I don't really know what it is. Like, yeah. So a coach, you know, like all coaches work with their clients in a way where they support them. It's not so much that I tell you what you have to do. I mean, I do a little bit of that too, <laughs> but it's rather than working together with them and, and, uh, figuring out, uh, helping them to kind of make, uh, goals, set goals, support them in, in sticking to them. Uh, 
introducing new concepts of uh, of healthy eating one step at a time because if i would give you 20 things to change in your life you would never be able to do that but by uh, you know having a coach you get maybe a couple of things every two weeks and then you can incorporate that into your life and gradually over a period of let's say five six seven eight uh, coaching sessions you kind of get to a place where you feel comfortable and you have learned enough about food to understand what works for you what doesn't you have experienced it too you know because uh, the thing with food is that it's so individual and there you know you cannot say that this one food is is going to be good for everybody or this com combination is going to be good for everybody so it's really a matter of um, experientially uh, figuring it out and um, what I loved about the Institute for Integrative Nutrition is that they do not have a fixed philosophy of what healthy food means. There were so many people that went to the school who, let's say, were meat eaters, came out vegetarians, but also vice versa. So, um, and I, I personally don't think we need to put ourselves in any box, you know, of course, like, you know, I am a meat eater and I'm only going to eat meat or I'm going to only eat vegetables, you know, uh, for example, in the winter, I like to eat a little meat because it's warming, you know, it makes sense to have some meat in the winter. Um, and, uh, so, you know, there can be a little give and take and it doesn't have to be very strict and, uh. And the most important thing is to make people aware, you know, how food really does affect our bodies and encourage our clients to start listening to their bodies because our bodies really talk to us all the time. You know, they don't have language, but they give us signs. They give us a little tightness here or a little fullness there or some bloating here or maybe your skin looks funny one day, you know. So these are all signs that your body gives you to tell you that something is not quite right and something needs to be adjusted. So how can you go about figuring out which thing it is that you're consuming is causing which thing in your body? That well, you're you, you, if you really want to do this systematically, you could do like an elimination diet, you know, cut back on sort of the, um, the known foods that give people either allergies or, you know, where they might be a little intolerant to, and then start adding one food at a time every couple of days. Uh, and that would be a good way to figure out what it is that, you know, doesn't fit with you. Okay. That's why also my spring cleanse is, is a good way to uh, get a feeling for that. First, to get a feeling for that, what it feels like when you don't have any problems, you know. When you, when you just consume, let's say, pure energy that doesn't have any negative effects on you because it, it just is a, such a different feeling to be in that body. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, your energy is going to be much more, uh, you know, higher but not hyped. Uh, uh, you, you won't feel tired. You know, you won't have funny cravings all the time. And uh, that's a beautiful feeling. So, so what, once you have experienced that, what it can feel like to be happy in your body, right? Uh, when you then start adding the food groups back that you were not allowed to eat on the cleanse, you know, you really are tuned in and you really can feel it right away. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's a nice side effect of, of, for example, doing a cleanse. And my, my cleanses are designed in a way that you don't have to starve yourself. You really eat yummy food um, and you, you don't feel deprived. So you also recognize, oh, you know, this is possible too. You know, I could eat like this and maybe just then add a few things to make it more interesting. But it's not like um, you, you're ever deprived. Yeah, it's not like those juice cleanses where, like, yeah, exactly. you know, you're drinking nothing but juice for, like, 20 days, and, and you're like, I hate this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I personally have never done this, and I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't appeal to and me <laughs> I I find it's a little too extreme. And then you don't learn anything, you know? Then you go back to your old way of eating, so, you know. But uh, by doing it with, with whole foods... Um, 
you really understand uh, and feel so much more, you know, how food affects you and what a difference it can make when you eat the foods that do you well. And then you can build from there. Hmm. So um, about when was it that you decided to start your health coaching business? Mm. Well, I um, let's see. I graduated from IIN in 2005. 2005. And then a year later, I did that extra year. So, you know, let's say... Like 2006, 2007? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did you go about starting your business? Well, um, at first, um, you know, I let all my friends know <laughs> what I'm doing. <laughs> and... Uh, and um, I I offered some free coaching uh, or did exchange like uh, exchanges like for example I had a friend who who does Reiki so she did Reiki treatments for me I did coaching classes I mean coaching sessions for her and um, then I started charging you know not too much in the beginning and then um, it sort of slowly built and constantly you're you're building your mailing list uh, I used to go to health fairs and have my little stand and, uh, you know, gather people's addresses and over the years. And then when I moved to Beacon, I, I was part of the um, Southern Duchess uh, Chamber of Commerce. So that was a good way of, of meeting people. And I, I went there quite religiously to all kinds of different events. So did you did you find any difference in the types of people you'd meet, say in the city versus in Beacon? Um, how people were receptive or unreceptive to health coaching? Um, maybe slightly in the city, people kind of heard about it before or knew about it and and were more receptive than than up here. But I think by now uh, there's so many health health coaches around that everybody knows what the health coach is. So do you? find it's difficult to persuade people to hire a health coach or it's pretty easy people feel like they need it and are willing to, to do it? Well, um, when people already reach out to you, then, you know, you know, they're, they're ready and they want to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, back, uh, in the beginning, I used to offer a free first consultation so that um, people could get a feel for how I work and, you know, whether we are a good match. And that would also give me a time to explain more what we're going to do and how it's going to benefit them. So that, that used to work for me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I also know that you published a cookbook. Yes. So tell me about how you got into the idea of publishing a cookbook and what that process was like. I've spoken to um, a cookbook editor, um, and she kind of informed me a little bit about what's involved in the process a little bit from, from that perspective. Um, but, I mean, I haven't interviewed her on the podcast at all. So for anybody that's listening to the podcast that, you know, is a health coach or, you know, a nutritionist or a recipe developer or a caterer, I mean, people that might be interested in publishing a cookbook, I mean, that have no idea what to do. So can you go into a little bit about what your experience was like? Yeah, sure. And um, I'm sort of the type of person that <laughs> when I set my mind to it, then I just do it, you know? <laughs> So I did. I mean, I did, you did buy a no, farm I mean, in Estonia. <laughs> I did. I did self-publish it. You know, I didn't even uh, think that I could find a publisher. I didn't want to waste time with that because I had heard that first you have to wait two years until you find an agent, and then you have to wait two years until that agent finds you a publisher. And I was <laughs> not going to wait four years. But anyway, the whole thing started because one time. Um, my niece in Estonia took part in my week-long wellness retreat at the farm. And um, usually people really like the food that we cook at the farm. And we were all sitting around the, the table and eating. And everybody was saying, oh, this is so good. You should really write a cookbook. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then my my uh, my niece kind of perked up and, and uh, said, well, let's do it. And then I looked at her and said, well, okay, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
and um, and that's how it, it started. And my niece then became the producer. She helped me organize finding, you know, uh, the photographer and the editor and the designer. And we did it all in Estonia. So my first book came out also first in Estonian. And, um, and I had actually, um, uh, developed a workshop, uh, which I then condensed to this wellness retreat, this week on wellness retreat, which I did in Estonia. And so I, I wanted to not only do a cookbook, but I wanted to be there also some information about, you know, nutrition, healthy eating and, uh, and so I turned that material into my first 60 pages, which is an introduction uh, to a holistic way of looking at uh, food, and then to be followed by recipes. And I also knew that um, there absolutely had to be a picture with each recipe. I do not believe in cookbooks that have no pictures. Uh, just does not work for me at all. Uh, I mean, that's what gets you excited. Also, it shows you how the food should look like. <laughs> right. <laughs> when it's done, you know, there are a lot of clues in that yeah. picture. And it's so much more fun uh, to have a picture next to it. And uh, I mean, I hope my book really entices people to want to, you know, cook healthier. So the very first idea was actually to write, put, write the book in a way where it has both the Estonian language and the English language in it. And the recipe section would be, you know, the photo on one page and then half a page English, half a page Estonian recipe. But we started putting in the Estonian language first, and then we were already up to page 300. And then I said, no way, I'm going to make a book that's more than 300 pages by adding another language. And then kind of late in the process, we decided, okay, no, 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 we're just going to do Estonian first, and then we'll do another book in English later. So that's really then also what we did. So um, self-publishing in Estonia is a lot easier than here. Of course, you have to have money because self-publishing means you have to pay the printer to print the book. Right. And you have to pay the designer and you pay the editor and so on. But everybody who collaborated with me agreed that they can wait with the pay until I start selling the book. And then, you know, I can pay them with the money that comes from the sales. And the printer in Estonia was also very nice. He said that I have to pay a third in advance and can pay two thirds a month later after I've sold the book for a month. So that was really great because I was, in fact, able to sell enough books to pay the printer on time. And then shortly thereafter was also able to pay all the um, collaborators, um, you know, what their their fees. And in Estonia, um, because it's such a small place, there are only two book chains. Um, and I could, I could keep the books in the uh, warehouse of the printer and the bookstores would come and pick up the books. So oh, I had wow. nothing to do with distribution. You know, it just happens by itself. So how many copies did you print? Uh, we printed 2,500 the first time around. And then that took about two years to sell them in Estonia. And then I printed another thousand a year later. And a year later, I printed another thousand. And, um, and we got a lot of publicity in Estonia. It was all easy. I'm kind of famous there, so it's not not so <laughs> difficult, you know. Like people would come up to yeah. me and want to do an interview or want me to be on TV or whatever, you know, not like here in the States where you have to chase them. Anyway, so <laughs> that went really smoothly. And um, then when we did the English version, uh, we found a printer in China that was quite reasonable, and we printed 3,000 copies and also using some money from the Estonian book, you know, to put into the English. Um, and so at this time, the, the 3000 are pretty much sold out. Uh, they're just singular books uh, left over. And um, then um, I wanted to do a second book. So again, I did it first in Estonian, but that second book does not yet exist in English. And because of my experience that I had self-publishing, I was um, 
I didn't really want to do self-publishing again here in the States. I wanted to, you know, find a, a publisher. But I haven't been successful at it. I've been close, but it hasn't worked out yet. And just the other day, I had that feeling, I guess I'll have to self-publish again. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's going to happen, but I'm not making any promises in terms of time. Is, so is it a cookbook or? It's, it's exactly the same structure in the book where you have about 60 pages of nutritional information and then recipes. And also my recipes, they are, you know, um, by category. And for example, I have, um, grain recipes. And then, uh, before I get into the recipes, you know, I write about the different grains, how to cook them, you know, what nutritional values they have and so on. Then I have a section with, uh, legumes, right? The beans, peas and lentils. So again, I have an introduction to legumes and how to cook them and what to look out for. Then, uh, what else do we have? We have vegetables. We have leafy greens, uh, <clears throat> and then, uh, then there's soups and egg dishes and baked things and also a few desserts. And the principle is that, uh, I have a little, a little bit of animal food too, not meat, but I have some fish, uh, recipes and some chicken recipes. And, um, all the recipes are based on whole foods. So there's no white sugar on it, uh, in it, uh, no questionable oils, no white flour, that kind of thing. It's all whole grain, uh, intact whole grains or whole grain products. And then uh, in the second book, um, I have a few new groups. For example, I'm introducing lacto-fermented vegetables, and I write about that, how to make it, why they are so good for you. But um, what is it? Lacto-fermented? Yeah. <laughs> vegetables? Oh, you don't even know. Uh, no, I know. You know, I'm sure you know sauerkraut yes. and pickles, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, these are both lacto fermented vegetables, okay. which means, uh, they are, uh, put raw into a, a brine, uh, salt and water, and you let it just sit there. You have to make sure that they are submerged in the brine, that the vegetable doesn't float on the top. You, you know, put them in a jar and then you keep them at room temperature, uh, and, Pretty much the next day already, this process begins where the friendly bacteria that uh, occur naturally on the surface of all vegetables start to uh, process the um, complex carbohydrates in the vegetables. And um, a byproduct of that is uh, lactic acid. And that's why these vegetables taste sour. So it's not because they have been marinated in vinegar, but because of this lacto uh, fermentation process. And the amazing thing is that is that lacto fermentation is the only process you can do to food that actually enhances their nutritional value. So during lacto fermentation, for example, if you look at sauerkraut. If you look at the cabbage, at the raw cabbage, and then at the end you have sauerkraut, there is 10 times more vitamin C in the sauerkraut than there was in the original cabbage. Wow. Yeah. And plus you have an abundance of friendly bacteria, which, you know, everybody can use. Um, and the thing about the lacto lactic acid uh, is, is great because it um, acts as a buffer uh, in our stomach so that when we eat the sauerkraut and eat those friendly bacteria, we want to make sure that they survive the harsh, uh, you know, environment in our stomach and actually get into our intestines where we need them. So the lactic acid sort of acts as a buffer and makes sure they really get to where we want them to be. Hmm. And, uh, I mean, we all know that's really important that we have, you know, a balanced uh, microflora. And so it's, it's really, really great stuff. So outside of sauerkraut and what was the other? And pickles, pickles, which are little cucumbers. So right? what other kinds of things? Pretty much anything. And it's so much fun to experiment. So I'm trying new things all the time. 
Uh, so right now, uh, for example, I have something going with uh, beets, uh, cauliflower, and sweet potato. Mm. And beets, of course, you know, give the whole thing a beautiful uh, magenta color. It looks beautiful. Uh, no, any vegetable, really. So do you cut them up first, or do yeah, you cut, you them, cut in... them up? You cut uh, cut them up, and again, you cut them to the kind of piece you like. Beets, because they are kind of, you know, hard, right? You you often wouldn't eat raw beets until you, unless you grate them, you know? Mm -hmm. They're kind of hard to chew on. So beets I would cut into very thin slivers. But, you know, carrots, you can do carrot sticks, or you can do little rounds. It doesn't really matter. And then would you eat them raw, or yes, would you absolutely. add them to cooked food, or how well, would you use them? I You can just eat them as a little snack or as a little side salad, and definitely raw, that's the idea, because when you cook them or even when you pasteurize them, which, you know, you can buy pasteurized lacto-fermented vegetables in the store, but I don't see the point in that, because you kill first the bacteria and also the enzymes. Right, because the pasteurization um, of like cooking at high temperature, yeah, right? Is, yeah. But the point of doing this fermentation process is the bacteria. Yeah, so you don't want exactly. to kill them. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of enzymes also happen in this process, so we want to keep those alive too. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. But you can also make, you know, salads. Like what I like to do is, uh, you know, use homemade sauerkraut, uh, and I always like to add some um, ginger to it and some garlic when I ferment it. Um, and then I like to combine it with uh, cooked beets that have cooled already down and I cut them into pieces and I just mix the cooked beets with the sauerkraut and add a little salt, and, you know, salt you don't probably need to add, just a little pepper and olive oil and it's a really delicious salad. <laughs> yeah. So if you're not like a big fan of sour things, is this not for you or is there a way that you can still enjoy it? Well, it's up to you. I mean... Um, it's not that that sour. Or you mm -hmm. can also, when you make it yourself, you can stop the process before it becomes too sour if you don't like that it makes too sense. sour, you know? So that's why you should start to taste them like on the third day. And then you can decide is it already right or should, do I want to keep it going longer? In the beginning, they might just taste salty and you might not taste the sourness at all. So then they're not ready yet. Mm -hmm. So definitely you want to have a little tartness. Uh, and then they they taste so much better too when that has happened. It's amazing. I mean, you <laughs> you can easily get addicted to them. They're so tasty. Uh, hmm. And so then that that what you you were talking about as an added category to the new book. Yeah. So, so I have several um, uh, lacto fermented uh, recipes, and then I also added smoothies. And then I added baking with uh, alternative flours or flourless baking. How about sugarless? Uh, well, there's never sugar in my things, but I do use natural sweeteners. Such as? So I use maple syrup, honey, um, barley malt, or brown rice syrup. I also don't re recommend to use agave nectar anymore. Uh, when it first came out, it was sort of the, you know, everybody was so happy because... It's high in fructose, and fructose um, digests a little differently than, uh, you know, glucose or sucrose. And it seemed great because it goes to the liver first, and then it gets uh, turned into glucose, and then it goes into the blood. So it, you don't get that sugar rush from it, right? And it's low in the glycemic index, and it seemed like even a good thing for diabetics. But um, more and more... Um, Information now is coming out that because it is uh, so uh, high in um, unbound fructose, that that's not a good thing for the body because these unbound fructose molecules are uh, very reactive in the body. They turn into free radicals. They can attack your cells and uh, even alter the DNA, can lead to cancer and, uh, you know, premature aging and... And uh, similar to, you know, corn syrup, which also, and especially high fructose corn syrup, where you also has is have isolated fructose molecules, it also kind of messes with your hunger mechanism in your body. So normally, you know, you, you feel a little hungry, that signals you, you need to eat something. 
you start eating and then after a while you kind of your appetite kind of lowers and you kind of get to a point where you say okay now I'm satisfied with my food I've eaten enough but if you eat a lot of foods that have uh, fructose in it then your body your brain doesn't send you that message and you might uh, might feel uh, you don't get that message I've eaten enough so you know it can lead to overeating easily Mm -hmm. you don't get that satisfaction and uh, it also leads to wanting overly sweet things all the time and you know that's not a good place to be right yeah that's kind of why um eating a lot, a lot of processed foods is really bad right yeah, because exactly. not only do they have a lot of um broken down grains mm-hmm. uh, which also lead to things like inflammation and and higher um glycemic and uh, sugar high type, yeah, type yeah. experiences, but they also put in corn syrup and high fructose corn syrup and a lot of these things to make them artificially sweet, and that enhances the addiction pattern. Exactly. And also because of the broken down grains and the corn syrup and the fructose, it makes you not feel full, and then you need to eat more. And then because it has all this sugar in it, it has more calories, and <laughs> you know it's that whole like cycle and yeah, so exactly um but and you know if you have too much sugar in your blood you cannot use it then of course it gets turned into fat and that's the process of gaining weight right, right. Yeah. and then it also affects um your insulin mm-hmm. and then you get into the diabetic stuff and, yeah, and so exactly. it's just like this crazy process that the body does i guess yeah, but it's yeah. like um, becomes more, I don't know what the word is that I want, but, um, I guess intense, intensified mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> when, when you, the more processed foods that you eat and because the culture that we live in is all obsessed with all of those things, it's like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, the thing with eating, you know, too much processed sugars is that, you know, your blood sugar goes way up. And then your body actually makes more insulin than it really needs to. It kind of overcompensates in order to bring it down because it's actually, it's actually dangerous to have high blood uh, sugar. You know, uh, if it, if it reaches a certain level, you can go into a coma. And that can happen to people who are diabetic and if they don't have their insulin shot in time. So it's really not, you know, a joking matter. It's really very serious. Yeah. But then what happens if you overcompensate with the insulin, then your blood sugar drops and it drops below the middle ground. And that's when you feel again, oh, I need sugar. You know, in an, in a, in a, in a funny way, sugar is both the problem and then also the solution because it's true. At that moment, you do need some sugar. But right. if you go overboard again and have lots of white sugar, then you end up way up there again and the whole process starts again and and many people live on that roller coaster up and down and up and down all day long and so then they then when you're talking about how during your cleanse like you feel the natural energy and like your body feels good and and everything a lot of people they don't even know what that feels like no they've never experienced that they they just know what they know and think that they feel okay Mm -hmm. because they haven't experienced anything different yeah 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 Wow. And it and then it's enlightening to even experience that, okay, you can do this for five days or seven days or eight days, and you don't even have sugar cravings. That's the craziest thing. But it is naturally regulated, and you, you get enough sugar, you know, for your body to work, for your brain to work, but not too much. So you're, you're like, perfectly balanced, and you don't need any extra sugar. Yeah, and then you can eat fruit, and it's sweet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and it tastes like like yeah. I gave up sugar for the most part. I mean, you know, um, and it just it makes everything taste so much more intense. Yeah, exactly. Um, like you can appreciate the natural flavors and things in a much different way when you give up all the processed sugars, or at least you know, like ninety five to 98% of them. And I know that probably to people sounds like, oh my God, I could never do that. But one step at a time. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, and in the end, and it's not that difficult. And really once you not. 
literally your taste buds, you know, develop and become much more sensitive to the subtle flavors in natural foods. And then, um, then your body even wants them, you know, they, yeah. your body doesn't want that overly sweet, overly sour, overly salty, uh, you know, those flavors. Yeah, no, and it's like, even sometimes I'll eat a clementine, and I'm like, oh my god, it's too sweet, it tastes like candy, <laughs> like I sometimes can't eat a clementine, it's crazy, or yeah. like, I'll, you know, have um, something bad, you know, that is artificially sweetened, and I'm like, actually, it doesn't even taste that good, because it tastes like way too sweet. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It's just, it's it's crazy I how, mean, even, how that uh, even some vegetables are sweet, right? I oh, mean, yeah. Especially yeah, when you cook learn. them, you know, carrots, beets, sweet potatoes, amazing. And But here, you know, I, I always like to say that the main ingredient in healthy living and eating is awareness. And, um, I mean, I, I have never, you know, eaten too badly, uh, even before I went to the Institute. Um, and I ate obviously beets and, and carrots, but I never associated them with sweetness. You know, I would never think of vegetables as being sweet, you know, cake is sweet. Yes. Chocolate is sweet. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, when I went to the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, I started to really pay attention. And then I ate that same carrot. I mean, not that same a carrot, but <laughs> a <laughs> carrot or a beet. And I was totally blown away how really sweet they truly are. And yeah, so you make those connections uh, and it changes your life. It definitely does. I mean, for, I mean, it's funny because if you think, oh, I'm going to give up sugar, no, I can't eat anything else sweet. But really, it opens your eyes to things that are naturally sweet. And, like, I found sweet potatoes, and I'm like, oh, my God, sweet potatoes <laughs> are the best. <laughs> or, like, yeah. finding alternative ways to bake things, you know, like using extra bananas mm -hmm. in something instead of, you know, adding a bunch of sugar. Yeah. Um, you know, or, you know... Recently, I had the experience of we were having protein pancakes, and um, we only used pure maple sh uh, pure maple syrup. Uh, and I recently had the experience of maple syrup being too sweet. Yeah, I mean it is. I I didn't realize. <laughs> I mean, like I always knew it was sweet, but I had the experience of it being like shocking <laughs> mm -hmm. how sweet it was. Yeah, it's just. Incredible, really. I mean, it's a new experience when, yeah. once you start to like really taste things for what they are. Yeah, exactly. But you find so much more um, uh, pleasure from food that way, you know? The, all the subtle subtleness has come out, and it's really amazing. Mm. So we've been chatting for a, about an hour now, so I'm mm. going to get into our wrap-up questions. I have a few oh. questions that I ask everyone oh, okay. at the end of each interview. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the first one is, how do you define health or healthy, and why is that important? Okay, um, I think uh, health and being healthy is about balance, um, about being connected uh, within your body and also with, with nature. And um, why is that important? Because that's the best way to be. <laughs> it just <laughs> feels so amazing. <laughs> okay. Um, and what do you see as the biggest issue facing our society as it relates to food and health? Well, I think it's it's still the same thing. You know, the overly sweet things uh, that are out there, uh, the overly processed things. Um, I also am not a fan of uh, um, genetic engineering. I think it's really a dangerous thing and there's no way of knowing how it's just going to like multiply and, uh, you know, spread to other plants. And I think it's just a scary scenario. Um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> the biggest issue facing society related to food yes, and health. Yes, that's about it. Okay. And on the opposite side of that spectrum, what's the most exciting thing going on in food and health? Well, uh, the beauty is that more and more people, you know, make the connection and uh, more and more people uh, try to live healthier and uh, all the movement to, you know, farm to the table and 
all of these things, I mean, that's really amazing, you know, people going back to become farmers, and um, that's so inspiring, that's just wonderful. And um, do you have any programs or anything that people might be interested in knowing about or um, getting in touch with you about? Well, as I said, um, by the time this airs, the next thing is going to be my uh, uh, clean summer uh, eating challenge. So the best way to get in touch is to, to just to go to my uh, website and sign up. Uh, and my website is marikab.com. And can you spell that? M A R I K A B dot com. Okay, great. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Any final thoughts? Words of wisdom? <laughs> 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 Words to live by? <laughs> Well, um, words to live by. Okay, I think uh, you should always follow your dream and don't put it off because life is too short. Do not do it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Those are good words. So, all right. Thanks again to Marika for joining me today on the podcast. I'm sure that that was definitely an interesting conversation for a lot of people. I definitely enjoy hearing about your life as a professional dancer. That was my first dream as a kid, mm -hmm. actually, and I never pursued it because it was always told, oh, you can always do dance on the side, but you can't make money as a dancer. And, well, there's something you know, to it. <laughs> all these things. But you <laughs> but, do it uh, anyway. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's one of those things. <laughs> um, but it was definitely cool to hear about that and also just to hear in general about the uh, – the, uh, uniqueness of your life in general i mean living in all those different places and um experiencing the different things going on in society um throughout those time periods uh it's just i mean it's something that i didn't experience myself so i had no idea <laughs> what it would be like um so i hope that people can find some inspiration and um information from this podcast and that they'll be interested to check out your work and learn more about that so, Thank you very much. Thanks again to our guest, Marika Blasfeld, for joining me on the podcast. It was really great to chat with her and hear more about her life and how she's making an impact in health and wellness. I hope you'll get a lot from hearing about her unique life experiences and that you're able to find some tangible information and inspiration to work towards creating a healthier lifestyle, starting your business, publishing your book, or going after your creative dream. And thank to, thanks to you, the listeners, for tuning into this episode of Put a Fork in It, the podcast that offers fresh perspectives at the intersection of food, health, business, and creativity. I look forward to sharing future episodes and interviewing even more interesting people. If you have any feedback or suggestions on what you'd like to hear on this show, or you'd be interested in becoming a sponsor, you can email me at kalina at putaforkinitpodcast.com. Don't forget to check out the episode notes, links, and leave comments over at putaforkinitpodcast.com. You can subscribe using your favorite podcasting app, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. You can also leave us a review over on Facebook or iTunes. If you love this podcast and want to support it, please share it with a friend or donate on patreon.com slash putaforkinit. Thanks again, and of course, make it a delicious day. <laughs>